told that America is a Christian country from its origin, one nation under God. We've been taught that our government is for the people, by the people. But what if it's all been just a grand deception? What if the God, worshipped in secret by government leaders in our nation's capital, is in fact our enemy? And many of our leaders have been venerating him secretly through arcane rituals, setting the scene for the incarnation of this ancient entity. The nation of America has a hidden history that most people aren't really aware of. Okay, these are fallen angel entities over nations, over land, over different areas, but it's all stepping towards the new world order. They want the new world order, and the new world order is actually seen as a good thing in their eyes. So the, the third level is tapping into the spirit realm to be able to get your power and to be able to get your direction. He had found a secret location in DC where the Antichrist would be resurrected. Hey, what's up? This is Justin Fall. This is Wes Fall. And you're watching End, End Times, Times Productions. Productions. Belly of the Beast Director's Cut is kind of a brainchild of uh, my brother Wes and I. For about 17 years now, uh, Wes and I have been kind of embarking on this journey of understanding the real history of America. You know, where is America in Bible prophecy? Are there conspiracies at work today that were part of the founding of this nation? Things that were not taught in school, things that were not taught in church. Matter of fact, we've been taught quite the opposite in church and the opposite in schools from what true history tells us. And so Belly of the Beast Director's Cut is a film that really allowed us to shine all of our research that we've kind of been building up over the last 17 years. That's what this film is. Belly of the Beast is uh, the product of a long, many years, over decades, almost two decades worth of research that Justin and I were led to do. We started to, to see that the things we've been taught all of our lives, this society and the system that we've been born into, is um, there's a lot of deception in it. And it's set up for that purpose, to keep people blinded so that, you know, as we're seeing today, it's like all this stuff is actually making sense. All the all these things that we've been researching for almost 20 years now, um, 17 to be precise. We first started out to, to see some of the background information on the history of this nation. Um, you know, we were raised by the, or raised on the David Barton films, which, which teach an, an idea that America was founded by Christian fathers and principles, and that that's what is, at the root of the birth of this nation. And the film isn't saying that there weren't any Christians dur during the founding of the, of the country. It's not saying that by any means. Um, it, I mean, we have the, the Puritans are a great example of God's always had a remnant. He's always had his purpose. Today, his plan is still intact. And so that should give us hope as we see the, the crumbling of the United States from within. Um, as well as the rest of the world. We're, we're seeing the things taking place now that um, th that's why this film is so much more applicable today than it was when we made it. We set out to make this film because we wanted answers. We had heard some claims that were even more extreme than what we believed. Tom Horn had shared some information with us that just seemed very, very just unbelievably out there. But we know that he doesn't just make up weird stuff. So essentially, we said, let's go to D.C. Let's do some digging. Uh, if you're going to do research for any project, you generally want to go to ground zero for that topic. And for Belly of the Beast Director's Cut, Washington, D.C. was ground zero. So we wanted to go to, to Washington, D.C., and we wanted to dig up some information that we could then present to either validate or disprove the claims that Tom had made. Tom Horn believed that he had found a secret location in D.C. where the Antichrist would be resurrected. This idea that the, the biblical narrative of, of the Antichrist is going to suffer a deadly wound and then he's going to somehow be majestically, magically, supernaturally resurrected. And that was going to be a sign to the world that he is, in fact, a supernatural king. Now, what's crazy about the idea of a supernatural king is that this goes back to the writings of Manly P. Hall, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point today. Uh, but a supernatural king... That is exactly what the world will think when they see somebody rise from the dead. Matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself 
when he rose from the dead, he brought back others with him. A lot of people don't realize that there was a multitude of people that, that came back with Jesus. Uh, and there's evidence that they died uh, normal lives again. But regardless of that, Jesus did so many feats to prove who he was. Well, the Antichrist, the word anti means in place of, instead of. It can also mean against. But in the scenario of the biblical Antichrist, the one that's still to come, he is instead of Christ. He is a replacement Christ. He is a counterfeit Christ. So it makes perfect sense what the scripture says that he will suffer a deadly wound and that he's going to come back. And the world is going to marvel at this. But the question is, what are the events going to be that surround this resurrection? Where is this resurrection going to take place? And where does America fit into the picture? These were questions that we needed answered as we set out on this project. Tom Horn was very confident, especially after learning the Masonic system Surround, listen, there's a Masonic conspiracy surrounding this specific location in Washington, D.C. We didn't actually get right into the chamber because it is, it's hidden, it's locked, but we got pretty close. And while we were there, we, we had some very strange things happen that let us know that we were on the right track. It's basically what started off at Babel. They had a one world system, religion, language, um, probably economy. They had a one world dictator, Nimrod, and they were building, they were, you know, in defiance to God, they were going to build that tower to be able to go up there and, you know, who knows, you know, but God, God looked at it and we know how that ended. You know, he, he came down with, and threw the smack down. He threw the gauntlet down and said, it's not time. If I were to let this continue, then there's nothing that they wouldn't be able to do. There's elements that are controlling the scenes today um, that are trying to fulfill all these esoteric prophecies. The same thing that Nimrod started to do. Um, so you got to remember that Satan is the God of this world. Well, they were worshiping the fallen angels back then, right? They had the, the gods of old. These are the same ones that continue to be worshipped today by various different sects and, and you know leaders of government and the members of the deep state. Um, that's why they do the rituals and what have you. But it started off back then, and these people are... are that it's been passed down from generation to generation, um, this ideology, this belief system, that this Antichrist, this Messiah, this, this um, person in place of Christ is going to come. And right now we're seeing that they're setting up his world kingdom to be taken over by him. The nation of America has a hidden history that most people aren't really aware of. There's a lot of conspiracy theories and a lot of ideas but in reality america we have we have evidence that america uh, before it was called america that it was known as this great western hemisphere okay the western hemisphere that is what was prophesied by plato you had uh, you know even the greek biographer plutarch talked about uh, voyages to this great land in the ancient world so really you got to get past this whole american mindset of christopher columbus and the native american indians uh, governor dewitt clinton former uh, governor of new york he was also uh, pre held a, pre a prestigious role at the uh, new york historical society and he said on record that they had come into contact with ancient fortifications on our soil, and these fortifications were evidence that there was an advanced civilization far exceeding that of the Native American Indians right here in America. Now, this was, you know, this was on record with DeWitt Clinton. When you consider the fact that the types of news we get today versus the type of news that was, you know, in the early part of this nation, it's totally different. It's all fake news today. All of it. All of it all sides of it that you're going to get on TV. The old news that we found, we found articles, we found all types of information showing that there was an ancient civilization here before the Native Americans, that there was this idea of serpent worship on this continent, and Plato himself, which Plato is a worldwide household name. Everyone knows who Plato is, major occultist, uh, democratic mindset they believed that in the end times there would be a great nation that was going to rise up in the western hemisphere again the western hemisphere is the key the great nation of the western hemisphere is going to rise up it's going to take its rightful place as the beacon of light that was going to rule the world it was going to bring about a philosophic empire a one world philosophic empire and it was going to be utilizing the creeds and the beliefs of the old pagan world. What does that mean in modern terms? It's going to be a resurrection of the old religions, the Babylonian mystery schools, the secret societies, the gods of old, possibly a reference even to the 72 fallen angels 
you know, when you start talking about the, uh, the divine council, that there was going to be a resurrection of these things, a revival of these things, but specifically that this great nation. Now, when you look at the nation of America today, we literally fulfill so much of what the scripture teaches about this great whore of Babylon. And we break all this down in our film specifically so people can see history lined up with scripture. Why doesn't America show up in the Bible? Well, we believe it does. But you have to have eyes to see and you have to have ears to hear. You also have to have a better understanding of this nation, America. Now, let me take you back to some of these ancient views of America. The idea was we were going to be that nation that was going to bring about this democratic commonwealth to the world. Democracy, that was the goal of the ancient philosophers. Democracy was actually an occult view. Now, this might shock some people watching this video, but democracy is an occult view. It's all about bringing together uh, a certain type of system. Now, you start studying the end times, you find out it's a beast system that's a control grid set up for everyone to be living under one basic ruler. Now, think about this. The Native Americans... We have, re uh, we have evidence now that Native Americans that were here, not all of them, but by large, they had secret societies that were literally ancient forms of Freemasonry within their Native American tribes. Satanic rituals, uh, blood rituals. Uh, we even have evidence of underground kivas, temples, which I'm sure you're familiar with when you get into the whole Four Corners conspiracy. All these things taking place on American soil. But interestingly, we find out that the God who they revered and worshipped, you know, Again, not all of them, but by majority, we're dealing with a serpent god, a plumed, feathered serpent god. The same god shows up in Mexico uh, under the name Quetzalcoatl. You go down into Quiche. Um, in Quiche, they called him Gukumats, and then in, uh, in Peru, they called him Amaru. Amaru is the root of the word America. Amaruka literally translates over the land of the plumed serpent. Now, when we get into Ephesians and we understand what spiritual warfare looks like, uh, Paul tells us we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're actually wrestling with principalities. Okay, these are fallen angel entities over nations, over land, over different areas. These are, these are the things that affect what goes on underneath. These are fallen, by the way. These are not good entities. These are, these are the higher entities that are in league with Satan. Now, I believe that the plumed serpent God is literally Satan himself. So when you consider that we are living on a land, a massive land in the Western Hemisphere, that the ancients all prophesied was going to be the land that was going to lead the world into a worldwide global democracy that was going to be a beacon of light bringing about all the old religions and schools of the world. That really makes more sense now that we understand that our, our nation has been revering and worshiping Lucifer long before the Native Americans got here. They inherited these things from the giants, the white giants that were here before them, the advanced civilizations. And I'll even say this, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, who I believe Francis Bacon uh, was William Shakespeare. He penned the book, The New Atlantis. He believed that this land called North America, he believed that this was the site of the original Atlantis. He also believed that this land was going to be fulfilling major prophecies according to what he studied in the occult world, going all the way back to ancient Greece. So, interestingly, when you study the writings of the New Atlantis, you're going to find out that America has been fulfilling these prophecies. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. So much so that the occultists, such as Manly P. Hall, you know, who was a major theosophist, by the way, uh, he taught that America was going to be that beacon of light in the last days. He said that this nation was literally going to be shining like, like a light on a hill. That we were going to shine across the world and we were going to bring about the democratic commonwealth. We were going to bring about the old religions of the world, the superior ancient knowledge, and that we were going to be that nation that was spoken of by all the old mystics and the prophets of old. Now, part of that is also reviving the Egyptian mystery schools. All of these things have been fulfilled, but here's the thing. The secret societies, they have been maintaining... The language, the rituals, the esoteric knowledge, they've been maintaining all of this secretly for thousands of years, passing it on. But they've also suffered persecution over the years. That's why they called them secret societies. They had to go into secrecy. They had to hide these things because they didn't want the common man to understand that. What's interesting about this is that the secret societies that rule America, that founded this nation, we believe that was the reason that they came here under the guise of freedom of religion. 
See, we've been taught that freedom of religion was all about Christians being able to worship freely. Well, this is a Christian nation, we've been told. Founded by Christians, for Christians, by Christians. You know, I, I can't think of a greater lie, a greater deception upon this nation other than freedom of religion was for us as Christians. Furthermore, we have come to the conclusion that the freedom of religion was a cloak that would allow all the secret societies to come and operate freely here and even to set up policy. A lot of the policy that we've seen over the years was set with the mindset of protecting the secret societies, allowing them to get where they need to be so that they can operate and they can call down the gods of old. So the deep state has three different levels. At first, you have the legislative branch and bureaucracy of spreading this ideology out on the world stage. Um, underneath that, you have uh, the second level, which influences the first level. And so in that level, you have foreign governments. You have uh, um, occult secret societies, um, your skull and bones, and etc. Um, then you also have your think tanks and all of those and, and rich globalists that want to see their agenda make it to affect that first level. So that's the second level and they're all influencing the first level. Underneath that is the spirit realm. So these people that are in the secret societies and occultists and want to see it put out on the first on the first level on the world stage they're going and they're doing these these rituals and we we choose bohemian grove for that purpose because we don't have enough time to break down every secret society and their you know their purposes and whatever ultimately their goal is all the same um, but at bohemian grove it's like where the walls come down that's where the ritual aspect of things come and the third level of the deep state so the the third level is tapping into the spirit realm to be able to get your power and to be able to get your direction and that influences the second level, and that in influences the first level, and that's how it goes across the, uh, the world scene to be enacted. And ultimately, Luciferianism, Satanism, these rituals to tap into the other side to get their direction. Um, this is, uh, it's kind of like being, being a Christian. You know, God gives us certain guidelines in his, in his book. It's, it's our basic instructions before leaving earth. Um, it's our, um, our guidelines to be able to make it here, right? I mean, we're lost without that. And so he gives us uh, certain criteria on how to pray, how to communicate, how to worship. Um, he gave in the Old Testament very specifics about how to, to build the temple. You know, it's, it's just one example. And so when you're dealing with the occult side of things, that's the opposite end of the spectrum. That's the occultists um, who are, they're following just as, uh, just as diligently as a true believer of, of Christ follows him submits their life to him stays in the word does what the, i mean lives the word right just as that diligence is they're just as diligent but it's for the opposite side so with the occult you've got these practices that have been passed down for millennia and these people that are in power today are still practicing the same things they're still wanting to see this system come in so that they can have their final go at taking over this world, destroying Christianity. Ultimately, it's not against us. I mean, yes, it is against humanity, but ultimately it's against God. Uh, people say, well, what about George Washington? You know, because he's touted as such a, a man of integrity. Matter of fact, there's records that he attended church regularly, a Christian church. Uh, there's also records that he and his pastor, there's letters that have been written. Uh, matter of fact, Library of Congress is a prime, uh, a prime field to be picking truthful pieces of fruit. You want to get fruitful research? Hey, go to the Library of Congress. Uh, what we find out is that the pastor, uh, one of Washington's pastors, he said that overall, uh, overall he spoke with Washington time and time again that Washington was a deist. Okay, Washington didn't want to have a problem with the guy. He wanted to continue going to the church because it was a political move. But in reality, Washington said he was a deist. They went back and forth on this matter. This has been documented historically. He was not a Christian. He was definitely a deist. Now, others will argue that Washington uh, renounced the Masonic Lodge. Well, that's only a half-truth. Okay, He renounced the British Lodge. See, when he came over and started setting things up like in this new era, if you will, he had to renounce the old to become part of the new. And so he was actually part of the, the Alexandrian Lodge. Uh, I forget the exact number of the lodge, but he, if you Google this, you're going to find out exactly which lodge Washington was a part of in Virginia. I think it might have been Lodge 122, but I forget. Uh, I, I don't want to quote that. But he renounced the British, joined on with, with the, uh, the, the current lodge that was setting up in the New World. They were two separate systems. Now, they were very similar, but they were separate. Matter of fact, uh, their idea was to come and set up a government here that was almost identical to the oligarchy that they left. 
See, most people don't realize that. They don't realize that Washington was part of a grand conspiracy to create basically a new oligarchy here, a government controlled by a few. Uh, and that's all historical. We, we document that in our film. But the idea was to set that up, but to give more freedoms. But it still allowed the elite to run every thing that the government wants. Any, any move of the government, the elite were going to be involved. They were not going to allow the common man to make decisions. Uh, matter of fact, when the Constitution and some of the founding documents were signed, those windows were locked. You know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis uh, from the Pentagon, he, he came on record and he talked to us about this for the film. He points to the fact that the founding fathers were a deep state, which we would call shadow government. Back to Washington. Washington was definitely a Freemason. Matter of fact, they cast sprigs of acacia at his Masonic funeral uh, to signify him going on to the land of Osiris in the underworld. Now, they believed Osiris was already in the underworld, and they believed that Washington was the America's first Osiris, but he wasn't meant to be the final. He was meant to be a type. And we see that in how they went down and went through with his funeral. As a matter of fact, if you go back and study the, the death and the funerals of Washington, you're going to find out that there were two. You had two different eulogies. You want to look for the Masonic eulogy that was presented by Timothy Bigelow Jr. That literally paints the picture. Look, Washington was not just a porch mason. Okay, he he knew what he was doing. He knew he he was very much invested in this. Uh, we have evidence that not only was he a mason, but he was a mason in good standing all the way up until his death. A lot of people say he renounced the lodge. Again, he did, but it was the British lodge, not the American lodge. What's crazy about this is that he was literally being set up in a system that was a religious system that was set up to bring about the spirit of Osiris, a resurrected spirit, a reincarnated spirit, if you will, of Osiris to possess the ruler of this nation. Washington never made it to the crypt. They did not put him in the crypt that they built for him because we believe they didn't build it for him. They said they did. But it's kind of like the government says that they're building you know, these military bases and then immediately they retire the military base after they build it because they had other plans for it. The government does this all the time. They set up the crypt of Washington. They installed it very much strategically, which we break down all the, all the strategy involved here. The crypt of Washington is sitting at the, it's a basement level of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. This is literally a page out of ancient Egyptian magic. We break this down step by step by step in the film. We show everything how you go up and you, you walk into the Capitol building. You look up and what do you see in the dome? You see this thing called the apotheosis of George Washington. Now, if you really was a Christian, like so many people say, all you got to do is look up and see the heaven that George Washington is ascending into, which is painted on this massive mural. And he's surrounded by all the pagan gods. You say, well, why on earth if Washington was a Christian, why would he be getting deified in the first place into a god? That's what the word apotheosis means. Literally, Washington becoming a god. Walt Whitman, the famous American poet, said that, Walt, uh, said that George Washington was becoming the Osiris. Now, pagan gods, what does this have to do with D.C.? Well, Thomas Jefferson literally designed the city to honor the old pantheon of pagan gods. This is on record at the Library of Congress. People can investigate what's called the most approved plan. They, they literally built this city to pull a line from the Ghostbusters, how they talk about drawing down the power on these certain buildings, cursed buildings, buildings that are set up for drawing down occult power. The city of D.C. literally was built as a massive ritualistic chessboard to do public rituals in mass. So uh, the Washington Monument, people like to go and look at it. Everybody wants to see it, but they don't understand the history of it. But just the measurements alone should be enough to raise some question. It's 555 feet tall above ground, and the physics involved, in order to keep it from falling over, you have 111 feet inside the earth. So you're ending up with a totality of 666 feet total from tip to base uh, inside the earth. But what's crazy about this is that in the base of it, they have inculcated the magic Apollinean square. Now, they believe that this square has a binding factor to it, that it can bind certain things. Some people call it a 666 square. 
we do a full breakdown of this in the film and the 666 square basically what you end up with is that no matter how you add up the numbers in any of the lines you end up with 111 uh, with a total uh, number of 666 so what's crazy is that they they believe it's a binding utility but it also uh, goes back to some prophecies about the resurrection of Apollo. Now, the same entity that we would call Apollo, others call Osiris. So there, there's a, a connection there. Apollo and, uh, uh, Apollo and Osiris are the same entity. It's just from two different parts of the world. People can go back and look into the Sibylline prophecies. They can, they can understand that this is a very real connection. Uh, the Masonic Lodge has that same 666 square and the skylight of their ritual chamber, which we show in the film, uh, surrounded by the 33rd degree Freemasonic emblems of Isis. Uh, and what's crazy is that directly beneath that 666 square, you have their altar with the holy books, including the Bible. They believe that by putting the Bible underneath this square, that it's binding the power and influence of the word of God. But it doesn't stop there. There's a secret Bible bound in the testes of the Washington Monument. This Bible was what Dan Brown called the lost symbol. See, people have no idea how these books and this pop culture, such as Dan Brown and others, how they're, they're conditioning us to what's really going on. They're pre-programming us to accept these things. The Dan Brown Law symbol was a Bible, a Masonic Bible, that's bound in the testes of the Washington Monument beneath a 12-foot mini obelisk. Most people don't even know about the 12-foot mini obelisk. We were able to get photos from when they did some, uh, some renovation work over there. Matter of fact, Atlas Obscura got their hands on the photos and that's where we first heard about the 12 foot obelisk. No one else knew about it. Uh, if you look down at the base of the, of the main obelisk, you have what looks like uh, a sewage hole, a manhole with a metal cover. You pull that thing up, which you can't, but they did. And we got footage of all of this. They pulled it up and sure enough, you've got a 12 foot mini obelisk. 12 uh, is a mockery of the number of disciples of Jesus Christ. It's also in the occult world. That's the number of the perfect government that they believe that's going to be set up in the Novus Ordo Seclorum. Now, what is the Novus Ordo Seclorum? That is Latin for the new order of the ages. Anybody that carries around a dollar bill in their pocket, pull it out. You'll see the pyramid. You'll see the Novus Ordo Seclorum. That was what this was all about. The founders of this nation knew that this was the land prophesied by the old mystics. They wanted to resurrect their old gods right here on this land. And they knew for a fact that this would be the continent that was going to lead the world in this Novus Ordo Seclorum. I definitely believe that rituals are utilized to obtain technology. You know, we do a whole breakdown in our film, Hollow Earth Chronicles, about how the Nazis had this secret group of women known as the Vril Maidens. And they would embark on seances, and in those seances, they would begin to automatic write. And they would get information in other languages. Matter of fact, the, the, the blueprints given to the Nazis uh, did not come uh, for, for the bell. The, the, the Nazis had this, this craft called the bell or the, the uh, D. Glocka. That information did not just get given to one person. It actually got given in two separate uh, events in two separate languages. It was years later that they decoded those languages and re realized it was all one document. And it was a blueprint for what they believed to be some type of a time machine UFO. Some believe it was a time machine. Some believe it was just a flying craft. But yeah, I believe the technology is oftentimes given through satanic rituals and seances. Uh, but what I see more is the power and the atmospheric shifts that are taking place through these rituals that are changing the course of the direction of America. So, Bohemian Grove has the massive ritual that takes place out there on a yearly basis. And this was blown open by Alex Jones. I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers have seen the dark secrets inside Bohemian Grove. Um, we use a little clip um, documenting his interview with uh, David Gergen. We, we chose the, the David Gergen Street interview to validate, to show that Bohemian Grove is real, um, to show the secrecy involved in the participants that are members there, and also to show that the ritual is in fact true, that people participate in this. And this is the, this is, presidents from from times past you know this is um this is going back to late 1800s um you know early 1900s we have we have um in the film we have a whole bunch of um of images of pictures that were photographs that were taken and it shows this you know this ritual and the different things and practices that took place out there but to go back to your question about the rituals the big one that they do there on a yearly basis is the cremation of care and there's a big giant stone owl out there 
and it's um it's very i mean the only way i can describe it is that it's it's a high place it's it's equivalent to a high place of the old testament it's it's literally you're in the groves you know you've got the, your um your altar set up sacrifices being done there and i'm not here to say if it's if it's you know mock sacrifice or if it's real i personally believe that it would be real if you're getting the leaders of the of the world to come out on a on a yearly basis to go there and to participate in this i would think that it would be real um, also because of with it being truly satanic and luciferian and and you know um fulfilling those esoteric belief systems it would only make sense blood is required and high level rituals to be able to engage the other side so it would only make sense that they're they're truly doing rituals out there but um that's the reason we went to bohemian grove um in the film is not physically but while we covered that topic is just because that's um it's it's an encompassing of your secret societies, your occult systems, but it also shows that the higher ups, the people that are making policy, not just in America, but for the world, they meet out there and they do these things. There's a, a very strange ritual that dates back to ancient Egypt, known as the, uh, the Osiris Rising or the Rising of Osiris Ritual. You'll see it listed in different names on the internet probably. Um, Osiris, uh, he had a conspirator named Set, and Set wanted to do away with Osiris. So he had him cut up into 14 pieces. Now his body's cut up into 14 pieces. It gets thrown into the Nile River. And uh, Isis, of course, isn't happy about this. Isis tries to collect all the pieces up. And she's only able to find 13 pieces. So she fashions together those 13 pieces to form a more perfect union which is the framework of our 13 colonies, a more perfect union, based off of the myth of Osiris. Now, that's showing Egyptian magic even in the framework and the fabric of our foundation, right? It's not an accident that they brought together 13 colonies to form a more perfect union. That was all by design. It was all manufactured. But what's crazy is that she fashions together these 13 pieces, but guess what piece is missing? His genitals. So what do they do? They set up this ritual... That's what the obelisk is, by the way. The obelisk represents the 14th piece that they couldn't find. It is literally a phallic symbol. You find it in the Vatican. You find it in ancient Egypt. You find it here in the States. You find it all over cemeteries. You find it all over the Masonic lodges. It represents the phallic, the male sex organ of Osiris. And they believe by setting up this ritual. Now, it's all a recreation of the original ritual that took place between Isis and the 13 pieces of Osiris, uh, which we break down the full ritual in the film. Tom Horn breaks it down right there in the mall area of D.C., right between the Washington Monument and the Dome of Isis, which is the Capitol building. Now, this is fascinating because the original ritual had to take place between but we were in a courtyard between a dome and an obelisk. Putting those two together like that creates a power generator, literally a generator for this ritual. And the idea is that the seed of Osiris, the seed, is going to come up and emit out of the phallic symbol, which is the Washington Monument, and it's going to take over whoever our president is. Now, this sounds crazy, but think about this. In ancient Egypt, what had happened was the, the Pharaoh would go through this ritual, he would enter in a man, and he would exit the ritual a god. That was their belief. And they believed that their Pharaoh was literally the embodiment of Osiris because of that ritual. They were calling him up out of the underworld. So what we have in America is this same ritual, basically, that the Freemasons believe that they have maintained the, the proper language and the ritual to a T from the ancient world. They claim to have this still today at the inauguration of every U.S. president. The president is up there right there between the dome and the obelisk, right there in that power generator, and right around the corner at the Herodome, which is what they call the Masonic Mecca of the world, literally. The Herodome is, is this temple, this massive, crazy temple in D.C. They are up there beneath that magic square we were talking about, that magic 666 square, binding the influence and the power of the Word of God. They believe. They believe they're binding the power of the Bible while they do this ritual, and they are literally doing the raising of Osiris ritual while the presidential inauguration happens 
at every election. And they are literally calling on the spirit of Osiris to raise up, or Apollo, however you want to slice it, to come out of the underworld and to possess the president. So the president, you know, the president-elect walks into this ritual a man, exits the ritual a god. This is what the Freemasons believe. Now people are going to say, well, not every president's a Freemason. Well, most of them have ties to secret societies. But they're not all conscious of the ritual. Doesn't matter. This ritual takes place every inauguration. The Freemasons hold to this. Here's one thing I want to point out about this. The ritual that takes place there, it's been going on now since the beginning, uh, to, to our knowledge, since the beginning of, of this nation being set up. They believe that it's going to stick eventually. See, they don't know which president is going to be the final Osiris. Now, they believed in the foundation of this nation that Washington was a type. He was the first Osiris. Technically, every president in their eyes is an Osiris. But the crazy thing is, is that not every time the ritual is going to stick. They have to keep doing it until it actually sticks and they get that one that they've been waiting for. This is kind of like when we talk about Babylon working. You know, how, how many years, uh, you know, was Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard working in the desert trying to get this ritual to stick? They do this at the inauguration of every U.S. president because they believe there is going to come a time in a president that will be the one. He will be the one and they will go through this ritual when his body lies in state in the Capitol Dome. I believe they're going to do this ritual and that final raising ritual, that's going to be the one that's going to stick. I don't believe it's going to stick when they're doing it at an inauguration. The real one's going to take place when this Antichrist man dies. They lay him in state in the Capitol building beneath the 72 pentagrams in the apotheosis of George Washington. And that's not it. There's so much more numerology about the Capitol building and the 13 statues and the statutory hall. Statutory hall. But I believe that's the real ritual. That's the one where he's going to raise. Where the spirit of Osiris, which the Bible talks about this, this Apollyon coming up from the bottomless pit. When you uh, when you visit D.C., it feels like you're walking through Rome uh, with all the architecture and all the the pagan idols and the the statues, the monuments, even down to and Justin mentioned this um, about the uh, the Roman Pantheon being recreated um, and and shepherded by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson wanted to see reconstructed pagan temples to the old gods he wanted that to be what you see that that that's when you're walking down dc this is what you're going to see and he and he was successful in that being raised to think that america was built as a christian nation you would expect to see crosses you would expect to see statues of um, apostles um i don't know uh, that's just what i have in my mind if you're going to go you're going to see some representation of that and you don't see any of that there like it really feels like you're you're walking in in Rome because you've got the I mean all of the structures that are there and the and the statues and the of the deities and and what have you and so with DC it was set up specifically for that purpose it, to be um, to show to pay homage to these pagan gods and goddesses that should be a red flag for many people but to look at the the structure of it the way that they set up things um, on purpose. You know, you can look at it and everybody knows about the, the pentagrams and a lot of people will look down and say, even with the um, with the pentagram that's on the, the street layout, they'll look at it and they'll say, oh, well, it's not a complete pentagram because it's not, it's, it's missing a leg. Well, if you do any research on that, you'll actually find out that that's even a more powerful pentagram in the occult than a completed one is. So with that set up there, with the whole, um, the, the layout of the, the streets and the roads and the, the buildings being charged, um, being set up for the, the, the pagan gods and goddesses, um, it's done for a specific purpose to be able to harness power and give direction. The purpose behind it is actually for, for rituals, for, for ritual uh, purposes, to be able to harness the power of Osiris, for example, um, as we've talked about with the inauguration of every U.S. president and, and calling down that or calling up the, the seat of Osiris to, to allow the government to have a divine representation. And that goes all the way back to, to the Pharaoh in, in Egypt. Interesting. I uh, had somebody send me a video of, you know, lightning striking the Washington Monument just here recently. Uh, it was a big deal. I don't think it did any damage. I, I don't know. I didn't really look into it. But the video that I saw, and I, I suggest somebody, you know, everybody look look into this. Look at the video of the recent Washington Monument getting struck by lightning. That's what they're calling it, by the way. 
all I could think about was this looks like a massive ritual is happening right now. Like this doesn't just look like lightning striking something. This looks like some Ghostbusters satanic ritual taking place, drawing down the power. I'm not saying that's what was going on, but that's the first thing that crossed my mind as I saw this video footage. So I think that it's possible that, you know, everything going on right now, we're really starting to reevaluate how things are going to look in the end times because of all the things happening, all the propaganda going on right now with this whole coronavirus scare. It's changing the way that we're seeing some of these things. So I don't know for sure how it's going to look. But the best thing I could say is that it lines up with scripture. It might appear a little bit different. You know, we, we, we're going to see things more clearly as the days unfold. As a matter of fact, I've said this before, a hundred years ago, the best Bible scholars could not have seen the type of prophecy being fulfilled that we're seeing today. They, they wouldn't have understood it. Like we understand prophecy better now because we've seen so much more unfold. So I think as we get closer, we're going to recognize that. But it's all stepping towards the new world order. They want the new world order. And the new world order is actually seen as a good thing in their eyes. They see it as spreading the democratic commonwealth everywhere. They, they see it as bringing about that old form of, of supernatural government in the occult world and setting that up for the new world so that we can all live under this new Atlantis. That's literally the goal that we're heading towards. The end goal of, of all this is to bring about this final world system of the Antichrist so that he can reign. Um, we, we talk about globalization in the film, and we interviewed someone that's, um, that's, that was part of the United Federalists, um, and he's an independent, he's a, he's a strong believer, Carl Teichrup, um, love him to death, and he talks about an experience that he had going to a UN meeting as an independent of the World Federalists. And they were handed this, this book, this little booklet, and it talked about the need for a world king. How do you look at that? You know, it sounds, immediately it sounds very familiar and reminiscent of the Antichrist, a world king, a world dictator. Um, I think the things that we're seeing today is setting the stage for that as we document in Belly of the Beast. They're having to implode America from the inside in order to bring it down so that they can have a global agenda being fulfilled. So that uh, order out of chaos. You know, there's um, all these things that we're seeing fulfill being fulfilled today. It's, um, it's because of these people following the orders that they get from their rituals, um, using the power that they've obtained to be able to bring this about. Um, they're they're hell-bent on seeing this come to pass and the end deal i mean if you look at what the bible says about it um we're we're living in these times um matthew 24 is even more applicable today than it was when it was written the book of revelation same thing all of it really it's it's more applicable today and it's necessary that we're standing strong in that and standing steadfast in it um because without it what hope do we have without it it's going to be like the people taking a knee to bail you know they're going to see this supernatural world king come in um, who's going to be filled with the spirit of Satan, literally embodied inside of this human being? Um, so he's going to be doing lying signs and wonders. He's going to have um, he's going to have the answers that everybody needs to bring peace in. And the way that you do that is you have to have this problem. This is the Hegelian dialectic. You have this solution that you want to get to. So you create a problem, get the people to react and say, "Hey, we need it. We need to go. Somebody needs to do something about this." And so they'll gladly accept what the end is. They'll, they'll gradually uh, accept this next solution, kind of like, um, let's use it with the police system right now. Well, we need to defund the police. We really need to go do something about this. Okay, well, we've actually got this new police set up over here, you know? And so they've got these uh, these new laws and guidelines. We've just, you know, we've gone through it with a fine tooth comb. So here, take this new police. Well, that's also, you know, part of this one world system that we've been looking at for a long time. What we can expect is a one world currency. We're seeing the economic system just go to crap because middle class or middle America has not been able to work. We're seeing the implosion of the dollar take place right now because of middle class America not being able to work and provide for themselves. Um, we, there, we're seeing um, people being more dependent on the government to give them help. The elitists, they've already got all the money in the world, so they're sitting back just you know, watching it go to hell. The first thing I think that people need to take away is that we've been lied to. A lot of people get offended when you start talking about these types of issues. You know, in Proverbs, it says that, you know, a fool is going to discount a topic without looking into it. And that's what I see in America. I see a lot of Americans, and they're just quick to discount things 
write you off without even looking into it. Those people who refuse the truth, you know, they're going to be given over to a reprobate mind. They're going to be deceived. And I tell people, you don't have to be deceived. We're living in an age of technology. We're living in an age of information. We can just go to the Library of Congress. We can just go research these things. And so I tell people, take from this film real information, let it change your paradigm if need be, and move forward without having scales on your eyes. Look, we don't know how much time we have on this earth, but we do know that Jesus is going to return. When he does, we need to make sure that we're in good standing with him. We need to make sure that we are not deceived by this global scheme of the Antichrist. So a film like this is going to allow people to literally wake up from their slumber. I can't tell you how many people write us and say, man, that film changed my life. That film literally changed my whole paradigm, my whole view of America, my whole view of security in the government's hands. We've been deceived. So a film like this really empowers the individual to stand fully trusting on the word of God, not trusting in the schemes of man, the governments of man, and the security of man. Look, there's never been a more important and prime time to wake up to this information. We recommend that people take this information to the church, take this information to your friends, the unbelieving world. It doesn't matter. This film is for everybody. And people who don't live in America, they need to see this film too because this is going to affect them in the years to come. So the takeaway here is this is a single standalone film that literally, in my opinion, this is the most important standalone film that anybody can watch at this point. It's going to wake people up, it's going to shift that paradigm, and it's going to lay down the facts. If you head over to my YouTube channel, uh, it's, it's under Justin Fall. I think the link will be in the description. If you head over to the YouTube channel, you can check out the trailer. We just uploaded the new trailer over there. Um, guys, this, this is a film that people really need to see right now. The film gives a better understanding about how, how, to, well, how to understand what we're dealing with today. And it's, um, it can be very overwhelming just watching the news. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a product of it as well. You know, I watch it and I have to make sure that I, I only take in enough that I can handle because it's overwhelming. It, it steals your focus. It steals your joy. Um, with all of it, though, the film gives um, a better understanding about why. Because if you don't understand the why behind it, you're you're going to be confused about. I mean, it's 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 kind of like in high school that you know you get finished talking to somebody, and you're like, man, I feel like I'm so stupid. Like I just lost about you know 20 IQ points. That's what we're dealing with today. But if you understand the the mentality that's surrounding it, ultimately it's going to be a shot at Christianity and stopping it, and then the final world system of bringing all into one. Um, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, the, the timing of this is impeccable. Uh, you know, we did not even think about releasing this at the time that we did. It just happened that way. But with the elections coming up and, you know, the deception that it, every election is filled with deception, it's filled with schemes, chicanery. I mean, it's unbelievable. This is the time. People need to go ahead and see this so that they're no longer deceived by the system. They need to know where we started, where we are currently, what the prophecies say in the occult world, most importantly, what the Bible prophecies say, so that we are not focused on building our kingdom in this world. The kingdom that people are trying to build right now with politics is literally the kingdom of the Antichrist. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. The problem is, is that people in our country try to fix spiritual problems with physical solutions, and you can't do that successfully. The only solution is Jesus Christ, but it goes beyond just knowing Jesus. It also goes into this whole idea of you need wisdom that's beyond your salvation. In James, it says, if you'll just ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you liberally. What does that mean? That means God isn't just going to ask questions like, oh, why do you want wisdom? No, God wants you to be wise. God doesn't want you deceived. God hates lies. And so what we do is we're operating with Ephesians 5.11 in mind. We're exposing the unfruitful, wicked works of darkness. That's what we have to do. If we don't carry this information to the people, who's going to equip the church for these days to come? Especially with election time coming up. People need to be aware of what these things actually are, what they mean, and all of the conspiracies that surround them. And people who don't understand conspiracies, the connection between conspiracies and Christianity, they have not studied history. From the very beginning, Satan has had a conspiracy against Jesus Christ. And because of his hatred for Jesus Christ, he hates us. And he's got plans to try to deceive us in these last days. And this film is going to shake the scales off of the eyes of everyone who sees it. The biggest takeaway that I would have for anyone watching the film is that there is a solution. There's one solution. His name is Jesus. Amen. That's it. 
Um, there's, uh, there's no fear if you're in Christ. You've got love in Him. You've got peace in Him. You've got joy in Him. Things are going to get worse, but the Bible tells us that regardless of circumstance, regardless of any kind of situation that is presented against us, whether be it by the wrath of man, whether it be the the wrath of Satan, um, or even, you know, the battle that we have between the spirit and the flesh on a daily basis, the Lord is our solution. The Lord provides all of our needs, and it's according to his riches and glory. Um, so I would, I would just say that, yes, there is hope. Things are going to get bad. They're going to get, you know, they're going to get worse. But there, the hope is that all these things that we're seeing, it's more evidence that the Bible's true. And so that gives us, that gives me strength, you know, and to be able to see other members of the body of Christ not bowing the knee to Baal, um, continuing to stay stand fat, or steadfast and continuing to stay in the word. Um, that's the solution we need. That's the only solution. That's how we become overcomers in Christ. So it's, um, it's basically, you know, choose this day to you know whom you will serve. Are you going to be going along with the kingdoms of this world, or are you going to go and be a part of the kingdoms of Christ? Um, the, 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 I guess the focus that I want to continue to, to push to everybody is that be heavenly minded. You know, Think on things with a heavenly perspective. All of these things are temporal. Your current affliction, it's, uh, it's temporary, but it's nowhere compared to the riches and weight and glory that we have waiting for us. And it's all to it's all to the glory, you know. Whether we live, whether we die, Christ, it's gain, you know. So, so there's uh, there's hope, and we just we want to use this film as as with the rest of our films to create an urgency within the body of Christ, uh, to let people know that yeah, the things that the Bible said, it's true, it's coming to pass, and we need to be spiritually prepared because if we're not, the battle's already won. Uh, If you head over to fourthwatchfilms.com, that's all spelled out, F-O-U-R-T-H-W-A-T-C-H-F-I-L-M-S.com, fourthwatchfilms.com. We've got Belly of the Beast DVDs. Uh, You've got links that you can go stream it immediately if you want to watch the film in high definition. Uh, We've got it uploaded to Vimeo. Uh, Make sure that you get the director's cut. Uh, The director's cut is the latest updated version. Uh, uh, We did the first release. Uh, This is not the first release. Make sure you get the director's cut. That's the one you want. (laughs) 